Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. Today's episode is called Producer Price Index Crash, Unveiling Inflation's Future or Corporate Gouging. Globally, PPIs have been falling and today we're going to dig into what this might mean for investments. Is inflation about to fall or is this a sign that com companies are expanding their margins and gouging? Whatever the story, the first implies you should sell stocks and the second implies you should buy stocks. This is definitely something we want to get to the bottom of. Today, as always, we have the star of the show, Nucleus Wealth's co-founder and chief investment officer, Damien Klassen. Welcome. Hey, Sam. Hey, Damo. My name's Sam Kerr. I'm the senior financial advisor at Nucleus Wealth. Just a reminder, the information in this podcast is general advice and does not take into account your personal situation. If you do want to discuss your personal financial situation, please go to our website at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact and you can book a call with me for no obligation chat. We are live every Thursday at 12.30 Australian Eastern Time. So jump on the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and you can ask any questions that come to mind and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. You can also follow us on your preferred podcast platform as our show is available on all the majors. So that's the housekeeping out of the way. So Damo, over to you to get us started. Yeah, so um, we spoke about uh, reporting season uh, last week and I've... Um... And we've sort of been through more of the reporting season and sort of getting, uh, you know, spent a lot of the a lot of the last week sort of reading through um, what companies are saying and and what we're really seeing in terms of the outlook statements because of this divergence between what's happening now and and what they're what they're expecting to happen. And so, what I really wanted to sort of dig into this week was this idea of uh, producer price indexes and lags and, and and a few other factors that are going into prices at the moment because there's there's a real divergence happening. Um, between what companies are saying and what we're seeing in price indexes and also between what companies are saying applies to them and what companies are saying applies to everyone else so there's there's this um there's a factor in terms of what goes into analyst forecasts is, is really what um you know the first year or so is, is what companies are saying uh they're expecting for for their profits and the company outlooks will uh We'll, we'll see analysts sort of on one side or, or another of those. So they'll either be a slightly higher or slightly lower. And and uh, the the actual outcomes, though, are going to be really wide. So, so for example, we'll have a company that says, yeah, I think I'll do 10% um, in the fourth quarter. And analysts will be somewhere between 12% and 8%, say, if you have 12% if they're really, they think things are really good, and 8% if they're a bit skeptical about how things are going to go. So the actual outcomes, though, once a company's told you it thinks it's going to do 10% over the next year, is probably more like minus 5 to 25% to, to or something like that. Like it's this broad range of outcomes where, um, and it is a little bit industry dependent, but but basically companies have a have an indication, but they really don't know where these numbers are going. And, uh, well, not they don't know, they, there's there's a lot of error around around what they're seeing. And so what you see in terms of analyst forecasts for that first year is really just a, a tight band around it and, and the error margins don't really, you know, they don't correlate between the error margins of, of forecast versus the error margins of, um, the, the error margin of analyst forecasts around the expectation versus the actual. So uh, so what we're really trying to work out right now is uh, have companies got it wrong and are they, are they sort of looking at their current s scenario and saying, uh, and what they're saying at the moment you know, in, in a broad sense, and certainly not every company, but but you know, a lot of companies are saying that they've got price rises through for the last couple of years. Um, so they've been upping my, I've been upping my prices by ten percent per annum, and I think I'll probably get something similar through in the next year. Maybe it'll only be eight percent, but it's going to be you know, it's going to it's there's they're they're not expecting a lot of change on that front. On the flip side, they're saying their suppliers, so the people one step up the queue, um, one step up the sort of production line they're having troubles pr passing prices through and they're going to find that prices are going to their, their prices are going to are going to be flat or or, or or possibly even down and so there's this gap's going to open up 
um, between and and margin. They can expand margins because I can put my prices up by eight percent. The guy one step up the line can only put their prices up by zero or one percent, and so therefore my margins are going to get bigger. Now there's a little bit of cognitive dissonance to that if you start doing across the whole market because effectively everyone is is one point in the the, the channel, and so um, and so there's this idea that look, are we going to go through the are we going to go through a process where that just filters through. And that's where I'll start with um, uh, the producer price indexes in, in the US. And, and we'll look at this from a whole bunch of different angles throughout today. So I'll start with this chart um, comparing the consumer price index in orange and the producer price index in blue. And we effectively see uh, you know, quite a strong relationship between the two. So, so the producer price index is, is the, the price that companies are, are, are seeing and the, and the consumer price index is, is the price that, that consumers are seeing at the, at the end point. So uh, we can see that the producer price index rose significantly higher than, than the consumer price index in, in the initial stages of the, the whole inflationary boom. So it was up sort of well over 10% in the US. And then uh, it's it's plummeted, you know, and it's 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 been sort of leading the um, leading the chart. So if you if you you can sort of shift the uh, you can shift that that index um, sort of across a, a couple of months, and and you basically what you're seeing in in the consumer price index is is quite often just a lag of what we've seen in the, in the producer price index. Now it's not always the case, but but it certainly um, yeah it it has been in the past, and and it certainly looks like it has been so far. So effectively, what companies seem to be telling us is that um, you know this producer price index, uh, yeah, that's that's going to keep falling, but but the consumer price index is going to is going to um, either stay where it is or or, or possibly even um, you know rise a little bit in terms of in terms of how that's how that's looking. Now, part of the reason for that is because what we're looking at there in terms of price indexes. It, it doesn't doesn't include everything, or, or, or it's it's an overall view that that there's some there's some individual items that, that really make a big difference to this and um, sometimes you need to strip those out and, and be a bit more careful so um, I've got an example again of um, uh, another one with a lag and this is sort of seeing uh, what I've done is I've pulled out a manufacturing index and these ones in particular have been much harder hit than others so so this is a, I've just just picking different countries around the world here's here's uh, Italy where they're still running at sort of six percent um inflation which is the chart on the on the left but the manufacturing um purchases man, purchasing price is is now down to one almost mo minus 10 percent. so yeah yeah dramatic difference between uh between the two and the cpi is very much just sort of been a lagged um follower on that uh if you look uh, the other thing is that you know this this isn't just a single country so we've so that we showed the top chart was the, the first chart i showed was the us then we looked at italy now we've got uh, industrial price indexes or, or PPIs for for Canada, which is sort of negative, hugely negative. Uh, for the UK, which is probably the you know the UK is probably the country struggling the most with inflation in terms of um, you know really really having a hard time getting that inflation number down, and and their producer price index is already back to zero. Um, so so yeah, so it's so it's happening globally. Um, Another thing, another thought you can have with this is though that well, actually these numbers, in particular the producer price index and the CPI, have been are, are overstated because of the effects of the energy um, energy prices in particular and food food to a to, to a lesser extent. And so um, there's a there's most countries have this thing called a core measure, and what the core measure does is it strips out food and energy, so you can sort of see what's happening with those. And we can see in this. Um, yeah, this is now the, the whole of the eurozone. We can see that the core CPI is actually holding up a lot more than the actual CPI. Uh, having said that, it, it never reached the same height. So the core CPI only sort of reached well, slightly more than half, I guess, of, of what the, of where the um, of where the, the CPI peaked out. Uh, and so there's, and that's 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 a reasonable argument in terms of saying, well, you know, for a lot of companies. Um, Fuel might not be a, a major cost, and so maybe you do need to look at the core sort of underlying numbers. I guess the other part, though, is that the there's a reasonable amount of the CPI 
that sort of flows through into other into other um, factors, you know, as time goes on. And so, one of the things we did see in the early stages was the, was the CPI numbers were very high, but the core numbers were staying quite low as as the inflation boom sort of happened. Now, um, as CPI stays high, though, then people who are you know people who have to live in the real world and have to face you know that they, they can't decide that they they're they're only going to buy core CPI things that you know they do have to face genuine they need to buy petrol and and they need to buy food and and these things that have been stripped out of CPI, um, and so that will affect the wage. Uh, demand and that will affect um, you know companies, other companies that have deliveries or other companies that need to that have those as input costs, and so um, yeah, so there's so there's a, a, a you know the negative case you could say as well. Yes, all these CPI numbers are coming down and the PPI numbers are coming down, but actually if a lot of it is just energy and, and food, maybe you need to strip those out and you'll get something similar to to what we're seeing here in the CPI. Is that actually the CPI hasn't changed by anywhere near as much. Um, so for producer price indexes, though, they do do the same thing. Um, you know, there is an X food and energy, um, and actually the US one um, also strips out some trade services, which are, uh, can be volatile as well. And we yeah, can see so there... Just, oh, just quickly, um, you know, I think a lot of people are very uh, familiar with the CPI, with the consumer price index, what's, what's sort of actually in that index. Do you mind mm. just uh, explaining what... what the producer price index is really made up of? Yeah, so a, ba a basket of goods that um, go in that are input costs into um, into the um, in, into products that companies are making. So what you'll see within that is, and they, they do have uh, various layers as well. So you'll have like your 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 commodities that sort of sit right at one end of it, and then your next bit is sort of intermediate goods, and 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 then it sort of works through the ch um, through the chain to get to your final goods. And so it, it's a it's basically a basket of what the the costs that companies are facing, I guess is a a good way to look at it. Great, thanks. So um, yeah, so okay, and so when we when we look at this, the producer price index is still relatively high, like still above two percent, sort of well above its its prior levels, um, you know, prior to uh, prior to COVID. But um, sorry, this is a core producer price index. But it has still come down quite significantly, and, and it is still on that trajectory of of falling. And um, and so uh, yeah, so if I guess where I'm trying to get to with this is if if the argument's going to hold up that um, companies are going to be able to hang on to uh, hang on to the price rises and, and expand their margins sort of going forward, then you need to make an argument that actually. It's specific companies in the in the supply chain because you know the supply chain itself is all falling off. Maybe you want to be focused on maybe some of those end goods um, rather than rather than some of the initial sort of commodity producers who who are seeing these these big falls um, in terms of the the prices that they can charge. Uh, the other way you can look at these is you can the, some places do actually even separate out the services um, PPI as well, and I'm just I've thrown up Japan just because one more one more country as well, just showing the same effects happening happening all over the place. Now Japan never had as much of an issue in terms of the producer price index, um, and on the services side, certainly didn't have as as much of a, uh, an issue. But we can see that even um, services are, are coming off across most countries in terms of the uh, producer price indexes for for services companies. And here's Japan, you know, um, you know, gone from two percent where it peaked out, which is Given, given the amount of energy costs that we're going through was um, was quite remarkable that, that it never reached any higher than that. And and now they're sort of back to that sort of 1% um, uh, on the services side. So, so yeah, so very much um, a uh, not, not particularly strong at all. We'll be back with the Investment Insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with the investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. 
Right. So, so okay, so we've spoken a little bit about the PPI generally and, and whether there's just this lag um, back through to the, the, the consumer price index. The second part then is looking at the um, at China versus the rest of the world because China uh, has been looking at, at negative PPIs for some time now. Like we've been talking about, oh, maybe it's getting closing in on a year where we've, we've had very, very low numbers. And the last, uh, I think, four or five months have been, um, have been negative in terms of Chinese uh, produced price index. And there's there's um, quite possibly an argument that that you know the rest of the world is really just a lagged um, uh, a lagged look at what's going on in terms of China for these for these numbers. Partly because China is a big exporter of, of a lot of these goods, and so and particularly manufactured goods. And so if they're seeing deflation in prices, and they're pushing those those out to to the rest of the world, then um, they're effectively competing and forcing prices down elsewhere. And so uh, we are seeing that that you know the US is, is about a year delayed in terms of what we're seeing uh, within the US within China, but China um, is certainly not looking at bouncing or, or getting any better. There, uh, if anything, that's you'd probably say it's getting worse. Now, so that's a, that was this chart I've sort of got up is a uh, just sort of showing manufactured goods, um, which is uh, you know as a as a as a better indicator for what's what's ending up in the US. Uh, if you look at the actual producer price index within China, which which goes to a whole bunch of other things, um, that's even more negative. So so we're looking at sort of minus five percent there. And and last time, um, you know that that's or oh, sorry that's sitting at, at levels that you know traditionally you'd, you'd be talking about um, you know, concerns about uh, you know, recessionary issues within that. And and I guess I want to highlight, you know, there's been a, a bunch of different announcements about Chinese stimulus in the last uh, week or two, and really um, none of those have been particularly exciting. Uh, they've all just been about, as we said, it's not about turning the whole property cycle back on. It's it's basically about giving support to those uh, companies so they don't go broke, but um, you're yeah, really not reversing any of that 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 big down, uh, downturn that we've seen. And then if you dig in, and actually maybe this might answer your prior question, Sam. This is a, the Chinese PPI sort of broken out into components. And um, so they sort of have these first sets, which is a, um, you know, the means of production and, and sort of mining raw materials processing. And, and they're all growing. They're all sort of shrinking at sort of negative 5% or, or, or greater. Um, then they've got these, <clears throat> or they, that's a, what they call the means of production. Then they've got the means of livelihood, sort of food, clothing, and, and general commodities. Which are uh, much better. They're still generally negative. <coughs> They're generally deflating, but but nowhere near as bad as some of those those prior ones. And then you sort of dig into the the um, you know the elements of their purchasing price indexes. So you know fuel and and all those you know uh, raw raw chemical materials and all those. Again, you know it's just pervasive right right throughout that sector. And then um, yeah, a couple of indices, a couple of indexes on on the on the right hand side that are are rising, but you know. It's not a it's not a case of it's just energy or it's just steel or or it's just you know one or two sectors. It's it's broad based. It's pervasive. It's right throughout that whole economy. Sort of saying it's it's more than about just one thing that we're seeing these these declines in prices. So um, now that's so that's the that's your uh, glass half empty you know um, view on this is that yeah look the the PPI is happening across it's falls are happening across every country. It's probably going to flow through to the CPI. It's probably going to flow through to comp what companies can charge. It probably means, um, you know, the company optimism on, on margins is, is ill-founded. But um, but there are some positive, well, sorry, there's, there's one or two positive signs around. Um, if you want to take the glass half full um, version, you could go with uh, the Philly Fed has got a manufacturing index. And its most recent data has come out saying that the... The future activity um, looks way better than the current activity. So, um, basically, what this is is this is a um, you know uh, if it's if it's above zero, then uh, companies are are expanding or expecting expecting expansion, and if it's below zero, then they're contracting. So, what's happening there is the current um, activity is is negative, and the future activity is, is quite positive. So, so saying that there's going to be a bounce. Um, the issue, though, is that um, there are big divergence upon the other measures out there. So I've got a another chart which is sort of showing the 
the prices paid versus the prices received <coughs> for for the for manufacturers. And there's been these been this big bounce in terms of prices received in in the last couple of months, um, but that's that's completely at odds to what we're seeing in in there's four or five other um, uh, surveys that are out there. Um, yeah, Dallas, Kansas City, New York, Richmond, and they're all basically saying the opposite. They're all saying that um, uh, that companies are the prices paid. They're not they're not managing. Um, yeah, the prices they're receiving is actually shrinking relative to the the prices that they're 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 paying. And so um, yeah, so you know, pick your pick your measure. I guess you, on one side it says, hey hey, we've reached the bottom and 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 we're headed back up. And the other four say, no no, it's um uh yeah we're still looking at, at at poor a poor price outlook for um for producers uh the other sort of glass half empty version is your is your credit conditions uh and you know we've touched on that a number of times but i just want to highlight again that um you know there's a pretty good correlation between um the new orders manufacturing new orders and and what we're seeing in terms of tightening credit standards and um the tightening credit standards are pointing are pointing at you know continued weakness in terms of that that tends to be the leading indicator and and the manufacturing tends to be the lagging indicator so so credit credit standards tighten and then therefore companies can't can't um their, their economic activity goes down they they make fewer orders and and um and that sort of flows through so <clears throat> so yes so that's sort of where we're sitting in in that part of the cycle um. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing, but want a low cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost a hundred different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. Okay, we're back, everyone. Uh, if there's any viewer questions, uh, please pop them in the chat box now. Uh, we're just going to have a shorter episode today. Uh, and back to you, Damo. Yeah, so I wanted to bring up this. So I wanted to bring back to reporting season and what we're seeing to date. So I've got here the um, the quarterly earnings growth expected by uh, – uh, by, by this is just S and P companies, but it, it's pretty close to what's happening on a on a global basis as well. So you know the story was um, twelve months ago, everyone expected um, you know between eight and ten percent growth for Q one, Q two, Q three, and Q four for for this year. So we've already had Q one, so we sort of that that got downgraded right throughout the year, and then eventually um, came in at sort of minus three percent in terms of the the Q one um, performance. Uh, you know, earnings growth. Q2, uh, we saw basically the same, the, the, whatever downgrades to Q1 were, were pretty much reflected in Q2. And we're basically looking like at the moment coming in around about minus 10% um, for, for, for the second quarter earnings. Now, Q3 earnings, um, we've seen some pretty steady downgrades for, throughout the last, well, certainly the last uh, six to nine months, we've seen those downgrades. So they sort of, they, we didn't really only saw them start, I guess, nine months ago. And now, um, and we're, you know, we're into, Q3 already. So as, as companies are reporting, um, they're effectively saying, hey, this is what happened in Q2, which sort of finished in at the end of June. And this is what we're seeing so far in Q3. And so they've already got a month's worth of worth of data. And so they're probably, you know, it's um, probably making a reasonable guess at, at, at what we're seeing. So Q3 is looking like uh, about minus 1% um, growth uh, versus last year. So uh, yeah, I guess the signs are Poor, uh, you know, poor Q1, really poor Q2. Q3 is looking like it's it's going to be negative and, and quite possibly, you know, a, a reasonably, you know, I could easily see it at full another five, um, you know, four or five percent from from here. Um, but Q Q4, the numbers are really holding up, and and so some of this is uh, some of the big stocks, so some of the big um, uh, meta 
um, big tech stocks generally, Meta, NVIDIA, uh, Microsoft, some of those others um, you know, that, that are really holding those earnings up. Probably about half that growth rate comes from the, comes from them. So there's there's slightly um, you know, slightly overweighted because of that. But the there is the rest of the stocks as well. And the rest of the stocks, uh, it's it's um, they they still look quite positive. And and the outlook, you know, still very much is that that yes, things are bad at the moment. Yeah, you know, things were bad this quarter. Things are looking like they'll be yeah, a little bit a little bit bad Q3. Um, but by Q4, um, you know, all our clients will be oh, sorry, all our suppliers, their, their prices will be falling, and all our prices will be rising, and so therefore we're going to make these great margin uh, increases. And that's the part I have the biggest problem with is I have no doubt it's true for a number of companies, but um, it's hard to see that everyone's everyone's suppliers are going to be um, seeing falling prices while while um, while they've managed to keep pushing through those price rises themselves. And so I guess what I'm positing is. Um, you know, people and the way people look at these, and particularly people within companies, is you expect whatever's companies tend to expect whatever they've seen recently to continue. And in recent times, they have seen supply prices fall away, and they have managed to, particularly companies towards the the, the end, sort of facing the consumer, have managed to put through price rises. And so they're expecting that to continue. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is, uh, it's going to be extraordinary if they do. It's not something. It's not a typical case. Um, typically, we're either lagging. Uh, you know the producer price indexes in terms of the prices that get to the, the CPI, or we're lag and or we're lagging what's happening in China, and or we're lagging what's happening in the manufacturing sectors. Um, there is an element that yes, food and food and energy prices um, you should strip them out, but in 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 when we go through periods like where we are today, I do think a lot of the, the price rises we've seen and the demands for higher wages for, from from um, uh, from workers. Have been because they've seen these increases in in um, in in energy and uh, and food, and so if we start seeing those fall away, and we'll certainly we've already seen it on energy, and if we start seeing the food prices continue to fall away as well, then um, that's going to you know that's going to lead to to less of a demand for, for for wage increases. So yeah, so net net um, still on the case that we do think it's uh, we do think companies are being quite optimistic, uh, and I guess with that we'll go to the question of the week and then talk about the investment outlook. Okay, so this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. The question for this week is, do you think corporates are about to expand margins? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. So demo back to the investment implications. Yeah, so um, I think there's a, I think what we're looking at, and we've certainly seen some, some weaker markets just the last day or two, uh, which is sort of bringing prices back to, to you know, bringing prices back to, to to still very expensive levels. You know, we could still see prices fall quite significantly before we get back to to more normal levels. I'm increasingly negative on the the outlook in China. I think there's there's this hope, and it's been priced into the market this hope of this stimulus um, coming through. And 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 as each day goes past, and as each time we see another, you know, the announcements on stimulus. They're just not the types of stimulus that we saw in prior episodes. It's not the stimulus we saw in in the in COVID. It's not the stimulus we saw, you know, in 2015 or, or post the financial crisis. This is really just about um, trying to prevent an implosion in 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 Chinese um, uh, property developers. And so uh, for us, it's it's very much about you know from a factor point of view, we really want to stay on those quality companies. We're trying to avoid the cyclical companies. Trying to avoid not not completely avoid value. Value still you know, good to get, but making sure that where the value stocks we're getting are, are not the value stocks that, that are that are very cyclical, which which most of them do tend to be. Um, in terms of sector allocations, you know, very much of that staples and defensive stocks. Uh, having said that, you know, there's we're starting to look a bit of rotation throughout those because we are still seeing um, they're quite expensive. Uh, we we are exposed in in a number of different sectors where we can still see the growth coming through. So there are some elements of the the um, uh, uh, semiconductors and, and tech areas, but but that's probably one that is getting quite expensive. There's one of the places we are still looking um, is within some of the stocks that are the, the energy transition. They're they're all reporting you know good earnings. That they're they're looking at uh, 
the way forward. And then, sorry, when, I, when I'm talking about uh, energy transition, I'm talking less about, say, solar panel, power, solar panel manufacturers or wind turbine manufacturers and more about the companies that are supplying the services uh, to, to sort of grid connect those and, 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 and um, provide the, um, the services around the capital expenditure that, that uh, the utility is going to be making rather than the utilities themselves or, or the manufacturers. And um, so there's still, we can certainly still see a bit of value in that. Uh, and very much on the asset allocation point of view, we've been talking a lot about the international, uh, the Aussie dollar, the falls we've seen in the Aussie dollar in particular have meant that that international earnings have, have held up much, or international, sorry, um, from an Australian investor's perspective has held up a lot better than, than what uh, it has in, in, a, in a US dollar perspective. So you know, despite the recent falls, you know the the Aussie dollar's basically been been offsetting all or or, or most of that, and uh, also looking to keep a, a relatively healthy exposure to bonds on, on the back of that. Okay, nice one, demo. Um, so I just want to add to that as well. Uh, you know, with uh, with our screens and tilts, just some different ways some clients can play these. Uh, if you think companies are right, you could add a tilt to cyclicals or value. Uh, if you think companies are wrong, uh, you could tilt towards consumer discretionaries or industrials. Um, so just a couple of ideas. There's around 100 different screens and tilts to choose from. So uh, whatever view you have, there's always a way to play it. Uh, so that pretty much wraps us up for today. So thanks, Damo. Uh, we look forward to uh, continuing updates on the story. Excellent. Thanks. Awesome. If you enjoy our content, subscribe to our YouTube channel now. Like the video and click the bell below to make sure you don't miss out on any special episodes or future content. If you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do share it with them. We do put out a lot of other content in addition to the podcast. We've got regular articles and also the Nucleus Wealth Empowered uh, channel. So to get all this, you can subscribe to our weekly Nucleus News and Investment Insights at NucleusWealth.com. We do welcome your feedback on the podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comments section below or send us an email at contact at nucleuswealth.com. So for myself, Damien, and the rest of the team at Nucleus Wealth, thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.